So, at first I would like to apologize that this presentation wasn't on Wiuka, for I did it before the lecture, yes. I end five minutes before the lecture. So I put it there after the lecture, yes. So today we should speak about blood plasma and about, uh, about the components of blood plasma and about their functions. So what is it plasma? What do you think? What is plasma? Yes, so it's blood without the cells, yes? That's quite simply, yes? And that's one side on the plasma. When you, took, uh, when you take the blood and you do the centrifugation and you prevent the clotting, you will gain plasma. The second possible view is that plasma is part of water, whole body water. Yes, you know that in our body we have about 50 to 60 percent of water. Yes, and plasma is a small part of it. Yes, you should know that inside the cells we have about two thirds of whole body water, and extracellular fluid forms about one third of the whole water in our body. And from this one third, only one fourth is plasma, yes? Plasma plus lymph, yes, but plasma is more important. So what is W? Uh, w, the, the w, BW is whole body water, yes? So that's the whole water in our body, it forms about 50 to 60 percent, yes? It differ whether you are, you know that women have lower amount of water for they have more fat, also, older patients, they have less water for during our life, we lose water. Yes, the babies, they have about 70 to 80% of water in their bodies, yes? And if you have premature child, it forms about 90% of their body's water, yes? So, small child, that's only the sack of water, yes? So this is the second point of view on plasma, yes? But during the lecture, we will look only on the plasma as a part of the blood, yes? What's the difference between plasma and serum? Plasma contains those components used for the blood. Yes, and serum? Yes, yeah, serum doesn't. So, what is easier to have, plasma or serum in the hospital? Serum is easier. For, for serum, you need only blood. You can leave it 50 minutes, and after that you have serum, yes? There's the answer on this question, what is used more often in medicine? It's serum, yes? The problem is that it doesn't contain clotting factors, but for the majority of biochemical uh, investigation, it doesn't matter, yes? The levels of sodium, the levels of metabolites are still the same, yes? Plasma is used uh, in emergency tests. For example, on ER, they use the plasma, yes? If there is some emergency situation, they take the plasma, they take the blood, they put it in the machine, the machine does the centrifugation and they have very fast the results. And also plasma is necessary if you want to measure the clotting factors, yes? So on hematology, they use plasma. Other departments use mostly serum. So what do we have in plasma? The components of plasma, what do you think? Proteins. So proteins, yes? What else we have in plasma? Glucose. We have glucose, yes. What else? Salt. Salt, so it means ions, cations and anions. 
Fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, that's protein, yes. Fibrinogen is a clotting factor, number one, and it's one of the plasma proteins. We have their gases, yes, that are dissolved. So all gases, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Water. And water, yes, water forms about 92% of everything, yes. So therefore on the first place should be water for 92%. Then there are two big groups, low molecular weight compounds. There we have ions, nutrients, or you can call it energy substrates. There's glucose, fatty acids, ketone bodies, amino acids. Then we have here metabolites. What metabolites we have in plasma? Waste products. What waste products we have in plasma? Urea. We have there urea. What else? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, yes, you can say it. Bicarbonate, it's here, it's iron. It's also, you can say that carbon dioxide, bicarbonate, there is only equilibrium and carbon dioxide is waste product, yes. But we have there, for example, uric acid. We have there bilirubin. Here we have also, for example, creatinin, yes. And all other metabolites, yes. Our hormones, when you had a lecture about hormones, the last slide in every group was the degradation of the hormone, yes? And the degradation products of all, all hormones are here, yes? Unless they are proteins, yes? So the degradation products of steroid hormones are here. Then we have high molecular weight compounds. Very big group are proteins and the second group are lipoproteins, yes? About proteins, I won't speak today, for you have a special seminar about it, together with electrophoresis. So today I will spoke only about the lipoproteins, yes? Why we have lipoproteins in plasma? Transport, Transport of nonpolar lipids, yes? So, that was the beginning of the lecture. So the first important value that is measured in medicine is plasma osmolarity. So what is it osmolarity? What's osmolarity? You can read it and you can say it to me or you can try to remember it. So what's, plus, uh, what's osmolarity? It's the amount of particles per one liter, yes? In books you can read this value or this value, it doesn't matter. Whether you will write it in milliosmoles or millimoles, it doesn't matter. After this lecture you have to know about 20 values, yes? This is the first value that you have to remember. So the normal plasma osmolarity is between 280 to 200 or 300. It doesn't matter, yes? Millimoles. What is important that the majority of this value is influenced by the low molecular weight compounds. It means by ions, by metabolites, and by energy substrates. And therefore, <coughs> All doctors cal cal can calculate the osmolarity from, or they can estimate the osmolarity from these three values, yes? If you take two times the concentration of sodium plus the concentration of urea and the concentration of glucose, you will gain value that is quite close to this, yes? Of course, it's a bit lower, yes? Why here we have two times sodium? Why here we have only one urea, one glucose, and one there two times sodium? Because 
but why there is two times? We have sodium in intracellular and extracellular. That's true, but why do you think? Sodium has plus charge. And if you have somewhere plus charge, there has to be also minus charge. Yes, so in plasma we have a lot of anions. Yes, chlorides, bicarbonate, then proteins are also anions there. But we don't want to calculate with them and therefore we take two times sodium. For we know that according to the law of electroneutrality, the amount of anions and cations have to be equal. Yes? So the amount of cations and anions inside the cell and outside the cells is almost the same. Therefore, here is two times sodium. Urea, that's the member of the metabolite, and glucose is the most important nutrient that has the highest concentration. Osmolarity is regulated by antidiuretic hormone. The antidiuretic hormone acts in our kidneys and in kidneys its effect is that we reabsorb free water from the urine. Yes, from the primary urine we take only water and therefore we can decrease the osmolarity. Yes. So the regulation of osmolarity is here. We regulate the amount of the free water in our body. Yes? And the hormone is called antidiuretic hormone. It's produced in the hypothalamus. When you, when you can change the osmolarity. What do you think is the most typical cause when you have high osmolarity, higher than this value? Dehydration. Yes, and other. Alcohol. Yes, alcohol. For alcohol has also osmolarity. And one promille in blood is about 15 millimoles higher. So if you have two promilles, you have not 300, but you have 330. And therefore you do not feel so good. Yes, the morning after. For you have very high osmolarity and I will say to you later that our brain doesn't like when we have shifts in osmolarity. Therefore, we have headache and we have other problems. Uh, this is in Czech, but water that I think you know. Urea also, glucose is the same, sodium, and here we have proteins. On this picture, you can remind how the uh, compounds that influence the osmolarity in our body, how they can move through the barriers. Yes, you can see that water can penetrate both the capillar wall and also the cell membrane. Urea can do both. Glucose and sodium cation can go freely only through the capillary wall, but here they need to have some transporter and proteins, they cannot cross the barriers, yes? So that's important. The clinical significance of, of osmolarity. If you will go to the hospital as a doctor, the nurse very soon will want you to prescribe some infusion. And you will have about 40 types of infusions. So what type of infusion you will choose? That depends, of course. But you have to know that we have three basic types of infusions. That's isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. Yes, that's quite easier. And of course, that 
in most situations we use the isotonic solutions, yes? For the patient that comes to the hospital has some problem and we don't want to make new problem when we change the osmolarity of blood, yes? So if you want to give the other infusions, the hypotonic infusions or hypertonic infusions, you have to know why to do it, yes? The problem is that the hypotonic solutions, the effect is hemolysis for if you decrease the osmolarity of plasma, Inside the cells, in erythrocytes, you have higher osmolarity. So the water from the hypotonic solution will go into the cell and you can have hemolysis. Yes? This picture is not very good, but here it's quite nice. Yes? Hypertonic solutions, the opposite effect. Yes? If you give very concentrated solution, the water will go from the erythrocytes and also from other cells in our body into the plasma or into the extracellular fluid. So from this lecture you should remember these, at least these four solutions, the members of isotonic solutions. The first is the normal saline, but if you look here, you can see that it's absolutely in normal, yes? The composition is different from the plasma. It only has very similar osmolarity to plasma and also it's cheap and therefore it's used, yes? But it's not the balanced solution. It means the balanced solutions, as for example Ringer or Hartmann solution, they have the their composition is similar to plasma. It means balanced solutions. Normal saline is a balanced solution. It's only cheap and it has the same osmolarity as plasma. And the third solution is glucose. The 5% glucose is, has similar uh, osmolarity to plasma. But you know that our body can metabolize the glucose. So at the end, if the glucose from this infusion is metabolized, we have the free water in our body. And therefore, sometimes you can read that glucose is hypotonic solution for you give only free water to the body, yes? This Infusion is used more often if you have a dehydrated patient, yes? And you need to give him a free water. So the combination of this and these two solutions are used for dehydrated patients, yes? Uh, if the patient has dehydration. So this remember the division hyper, hypo, and isotonic and you should draw this picture what's the difference where the body where the water can go i said to you that i will tell you something about the brain yes of course that hemolysis is bad but our brain is very sensitive to osmolarity shifts and this can kill the patient the hemolysis can also kill the patient, but more often our patients die due to the problems here in brain, yes? The mechanism is still the same. If you have low osmolarity in plasma, it means you have low osmolarity in the whole extracellular space. Then the neurons and astrocytes, they will take water and at the end, we have brain swelling or brain edema, yes? Important is to understand that all our organs will have edema, yes? Our kidneys will be bigger, our lungs will be bit bigger, our heart also. But what's the problem between our liver and our brain when it has edema? Which is more dangerous for the brain, the uh, the demyelinization is also a problem for it can produce the 
uh, imbalance in our um, uh, briefing frequency, but more danger is this. Yes, Did ha this has very often long effects with the motoric system. Yes, yes, but this is more common and it's bigger problem in hospital. Yes. But why is brain more sensitive to osmolarity shifts than, for example, liver or spleen or kidneys? Yes. 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 For in the skull, you have still the same volume, and there is something that is called Monroe Kelly doctrine, and this doctrine that is quite easy. Yes, the doctrine is from the 18th century, when they realized that. In the skull can be only three things. What do you think that can be in skull? Monroe Kelly doctrine. So the volume of brain is the first thing. Yes, so volume of cerebrospinal fluid. And the last thing is blood. Yes. So that's not seen. So in brain edema, you increase this, and therefore the amount of cerebrospinal fluid has to be lower, and the amount of blood also. So in the first phase, you decrease the amount of cerebrospinal fluid, yes? And you will see that the brain tissue is in the whole skull, yes? There is no cerebrospinal fluid. And at the end, you stop the circulation in the brain, yes? So therefore, the brain edema can quite easily kill the patient for it stops the blood supply to the brain, yes? The demyelinization is also a problem, but not so severe, yes? So therefore, remember the hypotonic solutions are more dangerous. Yes? What? Uh, Monroe Kelly Doctrine here should be K, not C. Monroe Kelly Doctrine, yeah, that's quite easy. Yes, that the volume of the skull is still the same. So that's our problem. Therefore, if you will give the hypotonic solution, you have to know why, yes? And also the hypotonic solutions should be administered quite slowly, yes? For you don't want to have some fast decrease in the plasma osmolarity. That's especially problem in children. For, you know, in ch when you have small child, the majority of water is outside the cell and the dehydration can be quite fast, yes? Then this, you take this child to the hospital and there the doctor see yes, the osmolarity is 330, that's bad, so I have to give to the baby 5% glucose, yes? And after 12 hours there is nice brain edema and hypotonic baby, yes? So in pediatry you will learn that even in these small children, you have to give the hypertonic solutions, but for example, with the osmolarity 315, and slowly to decrease the osmolarity to 315, then you will give the normal saline, and after that, you can give the normal solutions, for example, glucose, yes, but not at the beginning. For the brain, swelling can develop very fast. So that was about the osmolarity. Here we have the list of low molecular weight compounds. So we have their cations and anions. Their concentration have to be equal. Yes, the sum of their concentration has to be equal. Then we here have the metabolites and the energy substrates. So this diagram you have to know to draw. And you should know that according to the electroneutrality law, the amount of cations and anions is equal. You see that the situation, here we have cations, here we have anions, that the situation is different. In cations, the majority is formed by sodium. This orange, 
that's potassium, and this brown, that's calcium. Yes? But uh, potassium and calcium. Yes? But you see that the majority is sodium. Here, in anions, is different. About the sodium forms more than one half, but bicarbonate forms also quite a bit part. And here we have something that is called an ion gap. So what we have here in the anion gap? What do you think is there? Protein. Proteins, for proteins have minus charge under the physiological pH, so here we have proteins. What else? Mm -hmm. And some examples. Every, at least three examples. Take something with negative charge, what can be in plasma. Bicarbonate is here. Oops, I did it again. So, there can be phosphate. What else? Sulfate can be there. Or they can be organic anions, for example, citrate, lactate, pyruvate, yes? During poisoning, there can be other factors, yes? For example, the um, alcohol is metabolized to acetic acid, yes? It can be here. Or uh, methanol can be metabolized to formic acid, yes? It will be also here. But normally here we have proteins, phosphates, sulfates, and then organic anions. So um, lactate, pyruvate, citrate, and others. That can be here in the anion gap. So we will go through this first. Sodium. Sodium is the main extracellular anion, sorry, cation and you have to remember this value, yes? I think that the easy way how to remember these values, the 20 values, is to remember the middle value and then you say so plus minus 10. Or if the number is very small, plus minus 0 0.5, yes? And very often it will fit. So this is the concentration. This is the most important role of sodium together with chlorides. Sodium plus chlorides, that are, they are responsible for over 80% of plasma osmolarity. So it means where you have sodium, there you have chlorides, and where you have these two ions, you have water. And therefore, sodium plus chlorides, they determine plasma osmolarity. Yes? Uh, sorry, not osmolarity, plasma volume. Why we need to have proper plasma volume? It means not only plasma volume, but also the blood volume. Because otherwise uh, you develop edema. <laughs> edema you develop when you have more water yeah. than normal. Yes. Yes. Yes, so we need to have the proper blood volume to have normal blood pressure, yes? If you have higher volume of plasma, it means you have more extracellular fluid, you will have edema and hypertension. If you have lower volume of plasma, you will have hypotension and at the end shock. And to maintain the normal sodium content, we have two hormones that have opposite effect. The first is aldosterone. Aldosterone is hormone that is able to reabsorb sodium back from urine to, kid, uh, to our body, yes? So you produce the primary urine in glomerulus and then in tubules, the aldosterone can reabsorb the sodium back to the body. Sodium together with water, yes? Sorry, so is that it reabsorbs sodium. sodium from where? 
from urine. Yes, uh, you know, in medicine we say that we have the primary urine, that's the urine that is filtrated from blood, and that at the end we have the definitive urine, yes, that is excreted. And the difference between this is very big, yes. Uh, every day we produce about 180 liters of primary urine, and we excrete only two liters, yes? And ad aldosterone is able to reabsorb sodium from the primary urine. The second hormone is atrial natriuretic polypeptide. Natriuretic, it means that it excretes sodium from the body. So opposite effect to aldosterone. Why do you think that here we have atrial? What's the atrium? Yes. Why? So you see that the heart is able to produce the hormone. Why? Because it controls the, the certain cells that are specific to blood pressure. Blood flow in the heart. There are no receptors that can measure the, the blood pressure, but it's connected to that. Not osmolarity. But if you have very high blood pressure, what, you know, heart is only pump. So if you have high blood pressure, it's very high, high work for the blood, uh, for the heart. So high blood pressure means that the stretch receptors in heart do the signal. We have high blood pressure pressure. So we have to excrete sodium. Yes, that's quite simply function, and why the atrial receptors can regulate the blood pressure through the content of sodium in our body. Yes? If you have low blood pressure, so it means you have lack of sodium and water, there is no signal here, so no atrial natriuretic polypeptide, and you have only aldosterone that reabsorb the sodium back. Yes? If the, you know, it's so that if you have over expansion of the arteries and also the, uh, not only an arteries, in the whole heart, then the stretch receptor says we have to pro decrease. So it doesn't matter whether diastolic or systolic, yes? For, you know, Atrial natriuretic polypeptide is polypeptide that is produced in atrias. But in other parts of heart, we can produce also something that is called brain natriuretic polypeptide, for it's also produced in brain, but also in heart. So we have the whole heart can regulate the blood pressure, yes, the content of sodium. And also if you look, the function of right atrium is different from the function of left atrium, yes? But how this work you will learn in the second grade when you will have the lectures about the cardiovascular system, yes? Chloride, that's the second, that's the anion opposite to sodium. So this function you know it maintains the plasma osmolarity together with sodium. What's new are these four functions. Chloride is strong anion, yes? It's derived from strong acid, from hydrochloric acid. And therefore it has very high, uh, great importance for the acid-base balance, yes? If you have more chlorides, in our body, you will go to acidosis. Your blood pH go lower, yes? If you are missing chlorides, you will go to alkalosis. Your pH will be higher, yes? And why it's so? For here we have the pair of chlorides and bicarbonate. If you increase one, you have to decrease the second. Yes, this is strong acid, this is weak acid. That's the difference. So therefore chlorides are important for blood pH. And this is also the problem 
of the normal saline. For a normal saline, you have the concentration of chlorides in normal saline is 154. And you see that the normal concentration is around 100. So if you give a lot of normal saline to the patients, you will give him more chlorides and you can develop mild acidosis. Yes? And this can be a problem if the patient has, for example, a problem with lungs or with kidneys, for you can make a new problem, the acidosis. Other function is that chlorides are in gastric juice. For in gastric juice, we have hypochloric acid. And also, neutrophiles are able to produce hypochlorous acid. That's this acid. They can produce hypochlorous acid from chlorides and from hydrogen peroxide. And why they produce this acid? To kill bacteria, yes? How they synthesize this, you will learn in other lecture about the metabolism of cells, of blood cells, yes? But from today, remember, chlorides are used to produce hypochlorous acid to kill bacteria. So these four functions you should know. Acid base blends. Yes, so normal pH. Yes. Potassium. Potassium is typical intracellular uh, cation together with magnesium. Yes. Inside the cells, it has very high concentration, 155. In plasma, we have this concentration, and this you have to know. We have their very low concentration, around 4.5. Four, uh, 4 There's a normal concentration of potassium. Do you think that this distribution of ions, the sodium outside, potassium inside, is important for the body or not? Or you can change it as you want. For it's cation for cation. So it doesn't matter whether you have potassium there or sodium there. The charge is still the same. Yes, the problem is that everything in the cells is prepared for the state when you have sodium outside and potassium inside. So of course that during the evolution, if you would change it, that it would be opposite, it can work. But today it can't, yes? So that's the problem. So the proper distribution, sodium outside, potassium inside, is important for many functions of the cells, yes? Is important for the membrane potential, and the proper distribution is maintained by this pump that you know, NAKAT pace. To see what would happen if you change the concentration of potassium in plasma, you can see the EKG. Very nice, you can see that if you have hyperkalemia, you will see how if you increase the concentration, how you change the EKG. If you, if you see this on EKG, it's not normal, it's called the ventricular fibrillation, yes? So there is no action of the heart, yes? So this is, when you see this, you have to start the resuscitation. And this will also cause the problems. That's also the one step from the ventricular fibrillation, yes? So these are typical signs, how look EKG when you have hyper or hyperkalemia, yes? And therefore the potassium has to be maintained in the small range, around 4.5. And also, these heart problems are the most often causes of death when the patient has problem with potassium, yes? Calcium, that's the last ion. You know that 
calcium is a typical extracellular cation, yes? Inside the cells, we have much lower concentration, 10,000 times lower concentration. You know that inside the cell was the function of calcium inside the cell. Why we need it? Yes, yeah, so it's a second messenger. What else? Muscle contraction. Muscle contraction. Or if you want to release the neurotransmitter, you need a phosphorylation of something that's caused by calcium and so on. Yes? So inside the cells, it has many functions. The functions, uh, or before the functions, I will tell you this. That's the normal concentration of, of calcium. It's around 2.4, yes, millimoles. But the problem is that this is the total calcium. But important is that in plasma, we have free and bound fraction, yes? And in calcium, it's important. Yes, all cations have the free and bound fraction, yes? But it has clinical significance in case of calcium. So what do you think is free and bound fraction? What does it mean? One more. Yes. So the bound fraction means that calcium is bound to something. About 46% of calcium is bound to plasma proteins. About 80% of this to albumin. The rest to globulins. <clears throat> then very small part is bound to some small anions, bicarbonate, citrate, lactate, yes? But important is this, 48% is free, yes? That's the free fraction, ionizide in plasma. So, these two remember, one big part bound to plasma proteins, second bound, uh, second free ionizide in plasma. And important is that only the ionizide, calcium, is physiological active. It can do the action. It can go inside the cell, yes? This cannot, yes? This calcium can be used for blood clotting. This not, that's bound to, uh, to albumin. So only this is important. Can you change ratio of these two fractions? Or can be these two fractions, the free and bound fraction changed, even if the total value of calcium is still the same, yes? You have two patients, both of them have the total calcium 2.4. One will have no problems and the second will have normal signs of hypocalcemia. <coughs> yes, it means cramps and other things. So how, how is it possible that the total calcium is the same and one patient is normal and the other patient has the hypocalcemia? Yes, so normally we have, we cannot produce more albumin than, more, than normal. So here you can of course change the concentration of albumin, then you have hypoalbuminemia. What is the end of that? You have more ionizide calcium, yes? So this cannot cause many problems. If the total calcium is normally and the ionizide calcium is a bit higher, it's no problem. So the patient with hypercalcemia, with normal calcium, but with the signs of hypercalcemia, has to have lower this fraction. So how do you think you can lower this fraction? But the total calcium has to be still the same. And how it works? Uh, alkalosis. 
So why is hypocalcemia related to alkalosis? Why do you think? There's the idea here. Is it true or not? If yes, why? No, this is almost still the same. Will albumin change its conformation when the pH changes? So Maybe slightly, yes. It can just change the conformation, but the change of conformation is not the thing. You know, albumin is what? It's protein. Exactly, and then it changes its affinity to bind. Yes, so if you have protein, you, the proteins have side chains that have some functional groups. There can be carboxy group, there can be hydroxy group, or they can be amino group. Yes? And if you have normal pH, some of them are dissociated, some not. Yes? If you increase the pH, the albumin will behave as a buffer, and the buffer will release the protons into the plasma. But then you have their minus charge the anion. And this anion, this new anion in albumin can bound new cation. It can bound all cations in blood, but of course it can bind also this ionized plasma calcium. So in alkalosis, for example due to hyperventilation, if you hyperventilate, you will breathe out carbon dioxide, you will make the plasma pH higher alkalosis, and this calcium will shift here. It will bind to albumin, yes? <coughs> and you can develop something very similar to epileptic seizure, yes? So before exam, if you know that you have very bad questions, it, you can hyperventilate about five to 10 minutes, and you will have nice epileptic seizure or something that looks like very similar to that. And all of them will trust you. Of course, the second possibility is to be pregnant. That's also very efficient if you want to pass the exam. So this is here written, yes? The pH changes decreased in ionized calcium when you have higher pH. And here is the list of role of calcium in the plasma or in general in extracellular space. You have special lecture about uh, coagulation, about blood clotting, yes? And calcium is necessary for proper blood clotting. It's a component of inorganic bone matrix, it's important for lactation and so on, yes? So we have break, if you want. Or do you have questions? You can say that slightly, yes. Yes. Or more cations will be bound to that. You know, for the amount of cations will be still the same for you will release one cation, the pro hydrogen protein you will release and you will their new cations. So still the amount is the same, but the problem is that the proton can change the pH. Yes. So the electroneutrality law will be still the same, but you will change the composition of cations. So then we have break till 32. So here you have the list of energy substrates in our body. You have to remember these values, value of glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids, yes? Here you have some small note to something, for example, that glycemia is strictly regulated, or 
that here the most common amino acid in our blood is glutamine. On the second place we have alanine. And that fatty acids are transported on albumin. Here we have nitrogen waste products. And you have to remember these values, yes? So ammonia, creatinine, uh, urea, uric acid, and bilirubin. You know, the bilirubin is more complicated for in blood we have conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin. But you have special lecture about this with Dr. Tranka about the metabolism of heme and metabolism, it means synthesis and degradation of heme for bilirubin is the waste product from heme, yes? But this values you have to remember. So the high molecular weight compounds in our body. About proteins, you have special seminar. So we should speak only about the lipoproteins. How are lipids transported in our blood? So there are three possibilities. So albumin is, on albumin we transport what? Free fatty acids, especially. Then also other things, but it doesn't matter. What else? The second possibility in lipoproteins. So the non-polar lipids are transported in lipoproteins. And the third possibility is freely in what? In plasma. And here we have, for example, ketone bodies or short chain free fatty acids. Yes? So three ways. Dissolved in plasma, we have short chain free fatty acids and ketone bodies. Fatty acids with longer chain are bound to albumin and other lipids are transported by lipoproteins. Lipoprotein is this. It's the particle that has nonpolar core where we have triacylglycerols and this yellow is what? Cholesterol. Not this. That's cholesterol. Ester. Yes, so cholesterol ester means that the hydroxy group on cholesterol, it's this, is esterified with some fatty acid. Yes? So in the core, we have cholesterol esters that are absolutely unpolar, nonpolar and triacylglycerols. And the surface of the particle consists of phospholipids, there's a normal membrane, with some proteins. Here we call them apoprotein, yes? That's the same as we have enzyme and apoenzyme, yes? So therefore here we have apoprotein and non-esterified cholesterol, yes? The hydroxy group can look outside the particle in the plasma. So this is the typical composition of the lipoprotein. We have only one cholesterol in our body. Cholesterol as are also triacylglycerols. What can differ is this. We have plenty of apoproteins in our body. We have three big groups of apoproteins. The first group is the apoprotein that has some structural role. And there are two members, apoprotein B100 and apoprotein B48. Uh, yes? So these two apoproteins have a specially structural function. The second group are apoproteins that are cofactors of some enzymes. For example, apoprotein C2 is a cofactor of lipoprotein lipase. It means that all particles that should be metabolized, or lipoproteins that should be metabolized by lipoprotein lipase, have apoprotein C2. Yes? Other cofactor 
is apoprotein A1. That's the cofactor of enzyme that is called uh, lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase. Yes, I will speak about this enzyme later. Yes? So all particles, there is only one particle, unfortunately, that needs this enzyme for the action is apoprotein, has apoprotein A1. And the last group of apoproteins are proteins that behave as the receptor ligands. Yes? So we have somewhere in our body a receptor and this receptor catch this apoprotein. This is the most important receptor, is the LDL receptor. And the LDL receptor catch particle that has two apoproteins. Apoprotein B100 plus apoprotein E. Yes? There is one particle, the particle is called LDL low density lipoprotein that has these two apoproteins and therefore can be catched by this receptor. And here you have other examples. For example, apoprotein A1 is a ligand for HDL receptor. This is particle that is called high density lipoprotein, yes? And here we have five lipoproteins that we have in our body. <clears throat> and they are distributed due to their density especially and also due to their apoprotein content. The names you have to remember. So we have chylomicrons, we have very low density lipoproteins, abbreviation VLDL, intermediary density lipoprotein, low density lipoproteins and high density lipoproteins. Yes, so we have five different, uh, five different lipoproteins. You have to know their names and processes that they are do. Yes? On this slide, you have one sentence, and this sentence you have to know. Yes? Other things you can derive from this sentence. Yes? So in one sentence, we can say that chylomicrons carry three acylglycerols and cholesterol esters from intestine to our tissues. Yes? Function of high density lipoprotein is to collect the cholesterol ester from tissues and it transports the cholesterol esters into the liver. There, the cholesterol esters can be degraded or converted to bile acids and cholesterol can be excreted, yes? So we will go along every group and now I will tell you what it does and how. So chylomicrons, we have, we have eat some good Czech food where we have a lot of fat and we have to transport the fat from our intestine into our body, yes? Unfortunately, triacylglycerols and cholesterol cannot be transported, dissolved in plasma, and therefore we have some particle. And chylomicron is this particle, yes? So, it transports lipids from diet into our body. The problem is that this particle is very big particle and therefore it cannot go directly in our blood but firstly is transported in our lymph and then in the place that is called thoracic, uh, thoracic duct ending it uh, goes into our blood, yes? So at the beginning this chylomicron is transported in our lymph but when it's in our blood, there we have this enzyme, lipoprotein lipase, that can metabolize this particle. Lipoprotein lipase, the lipase mean, means that it can hydrolyze lipids, and lipoprotein lipase can degradate triacylglycerols, 
and you will gain free fatty acids that can go into our cells. Yes? Lipoprotein lipase needs cofactor. It's apoprotein C2. And therefore, the chylomicron has to have this apoprotein. Yes? So chylomicron has apoprotein C2. After the lipoprotein lipase action, the particle will be smaller, smaller, smaller. And the particle is called chylomicron remnant. Yes? So the difference between chylomicron and chylomicron remnant is only the content of triacylglycerols and the size of the particle. Yes? And this remnant is catched by hepatocytes and destroyed there. Yes? This particle is sketched by the scavenger receptor that has ligand apoprotein E, but this you do not have to remember. Important is this. So that's the chylomicron. Do you understand? It transports lipids from intestine to our body, in the lymph, then in our blood, in our blood, it distributes fat into our tissues, lipoprotein lipase. Metabolize the particle, and at the end, it's catched in liver. Second particle is very similar to chylomicron, but the difference is that it transfers triacylglycerols that are produced in liver. You know that the chylomicrons can be produced in our liver, uh, that. Lip, uh, triacylglycerols can be produced in our liver if we eat uh, saccharide-rich diet. In liver, we convert saccharides to lipids, and this conversion is in liver. And we need to transport these triacylglycerols to our body, to adipose tissue, to muscles. And therefore, we have the very low density lipoprotein, yes? Therefore, it's metabolized also by lipoprotein lipase, yes? And therefore, this particle also has to have the apoprotein C2, the same cofactor as the chylomicron, yes? So very similar function to chylomicron. But here is one new thing. This very low density lipoprotein can communicate with other lipoprotein particles. It can communicate with high density lipoproteins, yes? There is enzyme that can transport, that can take two particles, a very low density lipoprotein and high density lipoprotein, and exchange the lipids that they contain. Very low density lipoprotein contain only triacylglycerols, and high density lipoprotein contain only cholesterol esters. So after this exchange, you will gain very low density lipoprotein that contain triacylglycerols and cholesterol esters. Of course, it has to contain more triacylglycerols and not so high amount of cholesterol esters, and high density lipoprotein that contain cholesterol esters and some amount of triacylglycerols. And this shift in the composition will change their density. And we do not call this particle very low density lipoprotein, but we call it intermediary density lipoprotein. So the difference very, between very low density lipoprotein and intermediary density lipoprotein is only the ratio of triacylglycerols and cholesterol, yes? For this, influence the density. Therefore, intermediary density lipoprotein is produced from very low density lipoprotein. Uh, here is mistake, here should be the cholesterol ester transport protein, sorry. And I forget to tell you that the enzyme that does this exchange is called cholesterol ester transport protein. It has the abbreviation CETP. 
for its transport cholesterol between the particles. Yes? The difference between VLDL and LDL is this. What's the fate of the intermediary density lipoprotein? We can say that it's similar to chylomicron remnant, yes? Therefore, this fate is similar. It goes into the liver, and there we have two possibilities. To destroy this particle, and then we have in the liver triacylglycerols and cholesterol ester. Or the second possibility is that in liver we have lipase, hepatic lipase, that can hydro hydrolyze all triacylglycerols in this particle, and then in this particle you will have only cholesterol esters. And the liver will put into the particle some more cholesterol esters, and you will gain new particle that is called low-density lipoprotein. So to make it more clear, you can say that very low-density lipoprotein intermediary density lipoprotein and low density lipoprotein is still the same particle, yes? It has almost the same apoproteins. The only difference is that here you have a lot of triacylglycerols and here you have a lot of cholesterol esters. And here you have the same amount almost as the triacylglycerols and cholesterol esters. Yes? That's the difference. But uh, I will only end. The amount of apoproteins is almost the same. Yes? Of course, there are slight changes, but it's very complicated. Yes? For the cholesterol ester transport protein can also change the apoproteins in the particle. Yes? Not only the cholesterol. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, apoprotein B four hundred uh, apoprotein B forty eight is typical for chylomicrons. For these three particles is typical apoprotein B one hundred. Yes? So these three particles, for they are still the same family, the same particle, they have the same apoprotein, apoprotein B100. Chylomicron is different and it has apoprotein B48. Uh, so we gain the LDL particle. LDL particle, is a particle that can be produced from intermediary density lipoprotein by the hepatic lipase. Or in liver, you can synthesize it de novo. Yes? So in liver, you can produce also new particles. Yes? Or you can take the intermediary density lipoprotein and change it to low density lipoprotein. Important is that in low density lipoprotein, we have a high amount of cholesterol esters. And the fate of this particle is to take the cholesterol esters to the tissues. Yes? If some cell needs cholesterol esters, it will put the LDL receptor on its surface. And you remember that the LDL receptor binds apoprotein B100 and apoprotein E. This particle has to contain both these factors, both these uh, uh, apo, apo proteins. In your books you will read, or only in newspaper, you can read that we have bad and good cholesterol. It's better to say that we have good and bad lipoprotein, for cholesterol is still the same, yes, in all particles. Why is this lipoprotein bad? Why you think? Mm 
Yes. Four. This lipoprotein transport cholesterol from the liver to the tissues. If you have very high level of this cholesterol, then the body tries to catch the cholesterol and not only the cells that need the cholesterol esters, but plenty of cells will make this receptor to catch the cholesterol. And also the cells in our blood vessels can do it. And after 10 years of high value of low density lipoprotein, you have nice atherosclerosis, yes? So therefore we call this particle also the atherogenic particle. And you have to know these values. The other values of these other particles you do not have to know. But you have to know that the plasma concentration of LDL particle has to be lower than three millimoles. And patients with diabetes have to have below 2.5. Yes? Here is below. For the lower value, the better. Yes? It's atherogenic compound. So that's low density lipoprotein. Transport cholesterol from liver to tissues. The last particle is high density lipoprotein. Uh, oh, this is still in check, so sorry for that. Uh, LDL particle has different action than to the low density. It takes cholesterol in tissues and it takes the cholesterol into the liver. And in liver you can metabolize the cholesterol to bile acids and excrete this cholesterol. The enzyme that fills this particle with cholesterol is called LCAT or lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase. The abbreviation is the donor is lecithin, the acceptor is cholesterol, transported particle is acyl, and the enzyme is transferase, therefore is LCAT. And cofactor is ApoA1. This particle, the HDL lipoprotein, is produced in liver or in enterocytes. And at the beginning, this particle is small empty disc that contains only membrane and apoproteins. This is called the nascent LDL, yes, empty disc. This disc goes into the tissues and the lecithin cholesterol acid transferase take the cholesterol from the tissue into this particle. So the older particle, the bigger particle, and the more cholesterol it contains. Yes? But it has different apoproteins and therefore it cannot be catched by the LDL receptor. Yes? But the content of this particle is still the same. It's cholesterol ester. The difference is the different apoproteins and therefore it cannot be catched by the LDL receptor. Yes? For, for the LDL receptor, you need ApoB100 and ApoE. ApoB100 isn't on HDL. Therefore, in books, you can read about many subgroups of HDL. We have HDL to alpha, HDL to beta, HDL3, yes? And these particles have different size and different amount of cholesterol inside, yes? This cholesterol is the good cholesterol, or it's the good particle. Why it's good? Yes, it's the prevention of atherosclerosis for it takes cholesterol from tissues to liver for the excretion, yes? And therefore you should know the values. The values are different for males and females. The value has to be higher than 1.0 millimoles 
for male and higher than 1.2 millimoles in female. Is that HDL? That's HDL, yes. Here is higher, that's different from LDL, for this is protective particle and therefore the more, the better. And here you see that unfortunately we have problem for female have more HDL. What's the result of this? More men have More men die than females. Yes. We die more often, or we males die more often due to cardiovascular diseases. Or it's better to say that we die sooner. No, it's true, for if you look into the statistics, you will see that more females die due to cardiovascular diseases. But if you take the whole population, but if you put it due to the age, you will see that we are, unfortunately, here. For this difference is only before the menopause, yes? For this difference is caused by female sex hormones. So, when there are no female sex hormones after menopause, the values will be equal, yes? So the difference in the morbidity and mortality due to cardiovascular diseases, the big mortality is before 50, yes? It's very rare that the female has some problem. But then after 70, the ratio is absolutely the same. And therefore it's true that females die also due to cardiovascular diseases, but not soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> so this has to go outside this. <laughs> so therefore, in the statistics, you will see that, they, that female die also. Difference is when. So that's about HDL, and it should be everything from the lecture. So three minutes, that's quite good. So, do you have any questions to this? If you will have problem, then you will look like this way. Patients with high cholesterol have this, I think that you cannot see it, but in the computer it looks like nice. This yellow depositions of cholesterol and fat, and also here, in cornea, we have arcus lipoides cornea. That's also the cholesterol, yes? And I will also make one competition. I make it also with Czech students. One teacher that teaches you has this, yes? So if you will find who is it, then uh, during the next lecture, I will give you lollipop, yes? Or if you know it. <laughs> so, do you have any questions?